At the present day, there are several types of electric motors, but for the moment, we're gonna focus only on DC motors. And to build one, we're gonna travel in time, looking for the necessary elements. Well, maybe not that far back. To build an electric motor, we obviously need electrical power. Specifically, we need a direct current source. In 1800, Alessandro Volta developed the first battery, so we're gonna take it so we can turn on our motor. In 1820, Hans Christian Ørsted discovered that an electric current could generate a magnetic field. Now this is especially important because it is this relationship that allows you to convert electrical energy into mechanical energy. In simple terms, when moving an electrical charge through a wire, it generates a magnetic field around it, following the rule of the right hand. The rule of the right hand tells us that when there is a charge in motion, and I imagine this is a charge, that advances in the direction of the thumb, a magnetic field is generated in the direction of the rest of the fingers, that is to say over there. On the contrary, if it advances on the other side, the magnetic field will be toward the other side. Easy. Now let's get back to the matrix. The magnetic field generated by the current in motion interacts with the magnetic field which is generated by other charges, like the one by this compass, causing them to try to align. Using the knowledge of Ørsted, in 1822, Peter Barlow built what is recognized as one of the first electric motors, which was composed by our battery, wires, a copper wheel, a bit of mercury and a magnet. In this machine, all the elements, except for the magnet, form a simple circuit for the current, with a special feature though, that it can keep the contact even when a wheel is spinning. In this way, by adding the magnet, which generates a magnetic field between its two poles, and let the current be transmitted through the circuit using the shortest path, that is, between the axis of the wheel and the mercury pool, a new magnetic field is generated, which interacts with that of the magnet producing motion. The only problem with this engine is that the torque generated is not very high, and therefore was not useful for real applications. So let's get help with our friend William Sturgeon, who made the following two great contributions to the development of the electric DC motor as we know it today. In 1824, he invented the electromagnets, which are pieces that work very similar to a magnet, but whose magnetic field is induced by an electric current. Basically, you take an iron bar, roll it with a cable that has an insulated coating so it doesn't come in contact with itself, and let the current pass through, which, following once again the rule of the right hand, generates a magnetic field that passes through the center of the iron bar. In this way, the magnetic field forces the charges of the piece of iron to be ordered as if it was a magnet, which, when curved, generates a perfect replica of the original U-shaped magnet, as the one used by Peter Barlow that we saw before but with certain advantages, like varying the strength of the magnetic field depending on the current used, or increasing the number of turns of the cable, or also being able to activate or cancel the magnetic field at will. Now, taking this into account, we could build a device like this, which on one side has a fixed electromagnet, and on the other, an electromagnet leaning on a moving axis. Now, we will have two possible situations. If the poles of the electromagnets that are facing each other are different, which means one positive pole and one negative pole, the ends would attract themselves and remain in a static position. Otherwise, if the poles were equal, these would repel and would be attracted by the opposite end of the fixed magnet until getting back in a static position. The only problem with this is that if you want the engine to keep spinning, you will have to change the connection of the cables for every half turn that the shaft do, and unfortunately, at some points the cable will be tangled on the shaft, blocking its movement. And it's precisely here where the second great contribution of William Sturgeon comes, when in 1832 he invented the commutator which consisted in making the axis responsible for reversing the direction of the current that passes through the electromagnet. 
To achieve it, he connected the electromagnet cables to two plates that surrounded the shaft, but without them making contact with each other, which also were connected to the direct current source only by pressure, meaning it could rotate freely. In this way, every time the shaft rotated 180 degrees, the contacts changed to the plate that was at the opposite end of the shaft, and therefore the polarity of the electromagnet was reversed, maintaining this cycle of movement and changing polarity endlessly. Now we are more than prepared to return to the present and see how an electric motor works today. If we take a DC electric motor, we will find the following. For the external part, there are two possibilities, depending on the size of the motor. For smaller motors, it's likely to find two magnets, while for larger ones, you would usually find electromagnets, also known as stators, which, regardless of which one is used, generate the magnetic field around the axis. Then inside, we will have an axis with the commutator and the connection with the direct current source, which, remember, can rotate freely, either using a pressure plate or a carbon system, which is a conductive material which, thanks to a spring, is always in contact with the shaft. Having the commutator system ready, we add the cables through which the electric current will pass, generating the magnetic field, which will try to align with the magnetic field of the stator. Another way of understanding why the movement is generated is using the rule of the right hand, but not exactly the same one that they used at the beginning of the video, but a new one. Why are they called the same? Well, basically they are mnemonic rules that are used to remember mathematical formulas that are behind, related to electromagnetism. And to remember them easily, we use things that are near us. And we only have two hands anyway, but anyway. This new rule of the right hand tells us that when we put our hand in this position, we assume that our fist again corresponds to a moving charge and we make sure that our fingers point in a direction perpendicular to one another, then the index finger is going to correspond to the direction of the charge that is moving, then the middle finger corresponds to the direction of the magnetic field that is going through the charge, and finally the thumb, which is the most important because so far we both knew the direction and the magnetic field, is gonna be the direction of the force that is going to generate over the charge. Or for the specific case of the motor, the direction of the force that is being generated on the cables that are rotating around the shaft. Finally, given all that, we move toward the new phase of the commutator. And since the force generated would not be sufficient, currently the commutator doesn't have only two sections, but many more, depending on the use of the motor. Thus, by adding two or more phases, the magnitude of the force is more constant and there is less waste of energy. 